Outlander author Diana Gabaldon on her two rules for writing a good sex scene, plus, what she really thinks of her book's fandom, and the one word she'd use to describe her next novel, Go Tell the Bees That I'm Gone. In the hearts of American readers, Outlander is second only to Harper Lee's beloved To Kill a Mockingbird. That's according to The Great American Read, a PBS-sponsored competition and celebration of literature in which the public voted not on the best novel, or the most critically acclaimed, but the one that means the most to them. Diana Gabaldon's steamy time-traveling love story about a World War II nurse who finds herself stranded in 18th-century Scotland came in at number two after the Harper Lee classic. Shortly after the presentation, Gabaldon shared a statement on Twitter about her second-place victory. Personally, I was thrilled, she wrote. To Kill a Mockingbird is a great classic, a wonderful read, and a book that means a lot to a great number of people in the current political climate, owing to its themes of racial and social justice. It totally deserved to win. I chatted with Gabaldon ahead of last night's awards program about what she really thinks of the television adaptation of her novels, how she writes those sex scenes, and the devoted Outlander fan base, members of which no doubt voted daily to ensure the series' great American read ranking. Below, the highlights of our conversation. What IT's like to be in the company of To Kill a Mockingbird and Charlotte's Web, the only thing I can see that, the books in the top ten of the great American read, have in common is a very deeply engaging central character or characters, the things that happen to these people whether they're a spider or a pig or anything else, vary of course, but they are full of conflict and stress, and it's the way in which these characters meet the challenges that causes a book to be deeply engaging. Of course, the language in which it's written is not unimportant either. Because having a resonant, direct, clear sort of story is part of the experience. Something that has particularly beautiful language or imagery is going to become embedded in your experience as a reader. What she thinks of Outlander fans, we are extremely proud of our fandom and they of themselves, as well they should be. They are deeply loyal, compassionate, and civil, educated, literate. You know, the first time I had lunch together with Sam Hewen and Katrina Balfe, the actors from The Outlander Show. They were just staggered. They had just met 2,500 Outlander fans and were completely bowled over. They said, this is amazing. They're treating us like rock stars. I said, well don't look now, but you are. And then I said, look, I've never had a bad fan experience. Never. Our fans are wonderful people. I attribute this to the fact that people with real mental derangements don't have the attention span to read one of my books. But on the other hand anyone can watch television. On the rules of writing a good sex scene. First, a good sex scene is about the exchange of emotions, not body fluids. In other words, what's going on physically is not really important. It's what's going on emotionally that's important. You use the physical attributes or setting, only as a means of anchoring the reader in the moment, but it's about what's going on between these two people. And that leads to the second principle, which is that a good sex scene can only happen between two unique and specific people. If you took one of say, Jamie and Claire's sex scenes, and substituted the names Anna and Christian, the two leads in the Fifty Shades series, for those unfamiliar, for theirs, it would not work. They are very specific, to each kind. And so, if you have a scene that could only be done by these two people, then it's probably a good scene. On people WHO think IT's unrealistic that Claire and Jamie would continue to have passionate sex well past middle age. The first time people brought that up to me was my third book, Voyager, where they've been separated for 20 years and come back together again. And someone says to me, do you think anybody wants to read about people who are 40 and having sex? And I'm about 43 at that point. I looked at her and said, I definitely intend to keep on having sex, and so does my husband, if he knows what's good for him. On the differences between the books and the TV show, I actually understand what an adaptation is. The show is beautiful, it's wonderfully made, but it is less spacious than a book. When I write a book, I'm God. I can do anything and I can do it at whatever length I like, with whatever impact. The show actually cannot do that. They're very severely constrained, in terms of both the space and the shape. In a book I can have a huge climax 5 pages from the beginning, and then a lull, and another huge climax 800 pages later. They can't do that. It's episodic television, 
which means that each episode needs to be structured with its own dramatic arc. On whether Murtaugh is coming back in season 4, I don't know if we're admitting that, Murtaugh is coming back, out loud, but everyone seems to assume it, so might as well assume it. If Murtaugh were going to survive into this part of the story, naturally, I would be thinking what would he be doing? He would almost certainly be involved in this particular aspect. I said, oh. If you're going so far as to get him to this particular point, I don't see how we could resist having him do this or this might be really interesting. Anyway, the producers and writers took both of those suggestions and used them very well. On her favorite scenes from season 4, there are two episodes that I particularly like and think are really well done and have a lot of emotional resonance. They are quite close to how they are done in the book as well. When pushed, she added, they are scenes that involve Jamie and his children. On her next novel, go tell the bees that I'm gone, I'm in what I call the chunk phrase. Because this is where I get large contiguous pieces of text that might run 20,000 to 40,000 words. And as I'm writing and doing research, I'm doing a historical timeline in the back of my head where I'm just sort of taking note of particular historical events or characters that I think I might want to use. Gradually the chunks line up against that historical background, and at a certain point, I will be able to see the internal shape of the book. All my books have an internal geometric shape. It's invisible to the average reader, though they can certainly see it if I point it out to them. Once I've seen the shape, the writing gets a lot faster coming in the end. I hit what I call the final frenzy. It's the last two or three months of the book where I know absolutely everything that happens and in the book itself has a life to itself. And when I'm working on it, it's like holding two ends of an electric cable and letting the current flow through me. That's the only part of a book where I could say that it actually flows. Other than that, it's like digging things out of a rock and pushing them uphill with your nose. Writing a book is a lot of work. That's what it comes down to, but it's going really well. On what this book is about in one word, Gabaldon has been able to summarize each of her books into one word. Her first book, Outlander, for example, is Love, Drums of Autumn, which became season 4 of the television series, is family. I've been able to do it for each of my books, and the fact that I know what this novel's word is, is also an indication of how far we are with it. This one is responsibility.